The GCC has long dominated the global hydrocarbon market and continues to play a critical role in shaping the direction of the industry. With its vast oil and gas reserves, the GCC remains well placed to power both the upstream and downstream sector and set the agenda for a greater push towards cleaner energy adoption locally, regionally and globally. The story of oil in the Middle East is not a contemporary tale, but began a long time ago. The first oil discovery in the region was in 1931 at an oil well in the remote Jebel Dukan area of Bahrain. Soon, one by one, each of the other GCC countries made their own discoveries, paving the way towards a radical transformation across the region. And then, in 2016, a new regional initiative was undertaken to further strengthen the association of these countries, and Bahrain was chosen as its headquarters due to the Kingdom's strategic location. The Gulf Downstream Association, or GDA, was founded by Saudi Aramco, Bahrain Petroleum Company, Kuwait Petroleum International, Kuwait National Petroleum Company, and Abu Dhabi National Oil Company as a non-profit organization that will serve as a catalyst for strong and sustainable growth of the downstream industry and provide a viable platform for knowledge sharing and best practice. The idea of GDA started a few years back mainly to promote the cooperation and the coordination between the oil industries in the downstream field to ensure that we have a vehicle within the GCC to share practices, share lessons learned. The Gulf Downstream Association, it's bringing a lot of experience of industry. We are focusing into bringing these experience together and putting these company into the prospective and its real position in the oil and gas industry. GDA's formation provides the springboard for effective partnerships across the region that will build on the strengths of each member organization in preparing a world-class workforce that can meet the challenges of tomorrow and most crucially, help in creating a voice for the region on international platforms by being innovative, by creating a knowledge hub and serving as a reference point for all stakeholders. Our approach is very simple. If I have an area of excellence that I've excelled in, then it only makes sense that among the different companies within the GCC that we will be able to share and all of us excelling at the same time. The key to GDA's long-term success will be the values that guide its operations, as well as the main propositions that drive its appeal. In year 2018, we are looking to develop other conferences uh, that will add value to our founding companies and members. Members have access to a rich repository of valuable information through GDA's very own portal, possibility to attend or opportunity to conduct industry-related technical or leadership events, share knowledge and experience and adopt best practice to pave the way for greater sustainability that includes tapping the invaluable expertise of the senior transitional workforce, enhance communication between members to help foster good relations with global industries and associations. Provide a voice for members to strengthen the three pillars of strategy, industry, government and education. GDA will provide for us an excellent forum to achieve operational excellence in our respective companies in areas like maintenance efficiency, personal efficiency, energy efficiency, as well as capital efficiency and project execution. The GDA is starting with the Arabian Gulf, of course, but we are also starting big and we're already interacting with all the multinationals. And the technologists are really uh, going to be an important part of uh, our membership portfolio, uh, the EPC as well. And this is where we feel our strength is by getting the stakeholders together, networking, identifying the business and technical challenges. GDA is poised to be the perfect platform for future generations in the GCC. For the youth in the oil, gas and refining sector, it will prepare them for tomorrow's challenges as well as help them manage the daily hectic demands of this innovative and rewarding industry. The choice is now in our hands.
Opportunities are all around us, and together with the GDA, we can create a stronger and more sustainable downstream industry. GDA. Share and Excel. Hello friends, welcome to yet another new episode of GDA Conversations brought to you by the Gulf Downstream Association. My name is Raj Hajaria, Technical Manager with GDA and my guests today are two extremely experienced people from a company called InGenero. InGenero is a technical consulting company who has been providing their expertise in the process industries on digital transformation, big data analytics, operation excellence and engineering solutions for nearly the last 20 years. This company has been first in the industry to introduce this technology which we are talking about today when they were not in vogue and they were pioneer in introducing the operational excellence program and big data analytics using off the shelf hundreds of tools which they have experimented with and used in the last two decades. They are based in Houston, India and Saudi Arabia. So we have two guests. The first guest is Dr. Pratap Nair. Dr. Pratap Nair is founder, president and CEO of InGenero. He was the instrumental in developing and applying digital twin concept for the chemical process industry. He was involved in many pioneering studies on simulation and modeling. He has PhD in chemical engineering from Rice University and an undergrad from the IIT Bombay. 
our second guest is jim brigman jim brigman is the managing director and principal and partner based in houston for engenro he had his bachelor and masters degree from rice university in chemical engineering also he has mba from harvard he was instrumental in establishing many startup companies in the field of engineering and chemical industry and he is now helping in general implement the big data analytics and the new technologies to enhance the clients operating performances today we are also joined by our secretary general mr auda al ahmadi and some selected subject matter experts from our technical committees the topic chosen by pratap and jim is a very contemporary topic we are all talking about it's the augmented intelligence the key to business transformation in this topic dr pratap and jim will bust many myths about artificial intelligence and show us how we can go beyond artificial intelligence and derive the real business value out of it for the benefit of our business and profitability so without further ado let me welcome on screen dr pratap nair and jim brigman thank you raj welcome dr pratap and jim so i'll hand it over to jim and we can get sure. started let's uh, tell you what let's uh, let's just we'll flip through the, the if if few slides on the presentation this will have some examples of 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 the implementation of augmented intelligence we'll talk a little bit about how we transform from artificial intelligence utilize utilize the uh, those assets and those tools to really go into the field of augmented intelligence which we feel is absolutely critical to being able to to get the digital transformation going so um and i think the the way to keep this interactive and and raj you should always feel free to to join in and and to to discuss as we go through these slides or question anything on these slides but we thought we just pull up a, a slide or two and that way um pratap and i could interact over those slides and be able to uh, guide kind of guided this discussion on on the the principles of 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 how do we how do we achieve this business transformation using using what we're calling augmented intelligence and it's really taking that machine learning artificial intelligence and making it augmented intelligence for the employee so you know looking at uh, the point that we want to make on this slide is, is looking at if, so if you look at the last three centuries where you're saying okay um for example the 18th century you 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 can see that it was focused on mechanical production that's powered by steam and water and you think okay then the 19th century that has gone to the mass production and you're using the assembly lines as utilizing electrical energy and then the 20th century you got the the fully automated using the electronics and ITs and computers and in each of those industries as you think you're moving from one to, to the next think of the companies that were there and it's what 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 i think that we need to to think about is it's a little scary that the, the companies that's that were that were the the the, the biggest ones for mechanical production using steam and water most of them didn't make it into the the the, the mass production using assembly lines using electrical energy and then those that were had the massive infrastructure that were the the leading companies back in 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 the 19th centuries they were gone in the 20th century and what i think we need to, need to recognize today is today we're in we're in that intelligent production artificial intelligence cloud computing big data type atmosphere but it's already changing it's already changing moving more towards that augmented intelligence augmented uh, analytics and so those industry those companies that were that that did not make that transition from one industry or one industrial area to the, to the to the next you know have not have not managed to uh, to survive uh, realistically you look at even those in the 20th century versus 21st century you're seeing some major companies drop out of the the uh the indices on on the on on the on the big companies companies that you thought would be the most powerful in the world you know being supplanted by the by the 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 basically the the data analytics and and 
companies that are act actively using that. I mean, granted, some of them are social media companies, but that are replacing it now. But that's what we want to focus on now is how do we as an industry keep up with the times and how do we go forward? And so, so that's what we're going to kind of go, go through. And Pratap, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, really the, the key is, uh, you know, we, we've all heard about a lot of these technologies uh, as part of Industry 4.0. Uh, so uh, now these technologies are there, they, they really uh, can be leveraged. Uh, now we're at the stage where, I mean, the technology and the tools itself are not going to automatically provide, uh, you know, what uh, the really, the step jump or uh, what is really required to take the, our industry to the, to the next level. And it's really utilization of these technologies. And that's what uh, we're seeing going into uh, the future, uh, and it's already started. Companies, uh, the early adopters who really started taking this technology uh, and who have been successful uh, are the ones who've been able to utilize these technologies to you know, get augmented intelligence out of them, uh, use that and analytics. You know, people talk of uh, internet of things, right, IoT. But I look at it as internet of people, because at the end of the day, what it enables is a person sitting anywhere around the world uh, to be able to have access uh, to that data and information. Uh, so that's really, uh, you know, this is the part that uh, we'll be focusing on. And this is what uh, actually, interestingly, we've been uh, doing a lot of work in this area, uh, even before, like Raj was saying, this uh, became uh, an item uh, in vogue. We have, as Pratap was saying, the Internet of People, where we're actually concentrating on, on augmenting their intelligence. And so when you look at uh, artificial intelligence, you understand that it, it is enabling the machines and the computers to uh, interpret and make decisions based on the information presented. And machine learning is that, uh, that ability to, to allow the artificial intelligence to refine its analysis and improve the insights uh, provided on a continual basis. And these are the tools that, uh, that I think are critical in terms of being able to, to provide that real-time access, which is so important today to provide that augmented intelligence. Um, Pratap, you want to add anything on that? Yeah, like Jim was saying, you know, the, these are very important uh, base applications uh, to provide the augmented intelligence. But what is interesting about this is uh, if you really look at it, both of these uh, as uh, techniques, have been around for a while, and uh, but what has really changed uh, over the last uh, perhaps decade uh, and uh, is the step jump in uh, you know computational power that is available, uh, the sharp drop in uh, cost of uh, data, and uh, of course the the speed of the internet. All these have tremendously helped in getting uh, techniques like this uh, actually uh, being applicable uh, to real, real time, uh, real life uh, situations. And uh, here, the, the, the point we're, we're, we're trying to make that is involving people as part of those tools is absolutely critical. And so, um, uh, I mean, it, we need to think that uh, that it, it's re really not about. Uh, in fact, Tom, you may want to click. I think this one has some animation on it. Right so there. Uh, so, right. So, the, 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 I think there's a myth that that artificial intelligence will replace people, and and certainly there's there are we can certainly expect. I mean, going forward in the future, that that is going to be um, you know more prevalent. However, you look at what we have today, the tools we have today, and how, and particularly for our industry. And that is, you know, just not the case. If you, in terms of being able to capture value from artificial intelligence and from machine learning, um, what is clear is that it's about people. It's about, you know, you, when you think of what makes a, a company great, you say it's great people. And that's still the case. And you say, how do I, improve my people to, to be able to do, to make the best decisions. And so that's what really, I think what we're talking about today is being able to say, okay, how do we go about that? And how do we 
take artificial intelligence, machine learning, and utilize that to be able to, to augment the intelligence of the, the people so that they're making the right decisions. And that's gonna be key. And we'll show some examples about how um, that's being put in practice in, in multiple, well, across, the, across the, the, the downstream industry. You look at all the refineries and the petrochemical plants and how that's happening. It's a great technology and it's, uh, you know, people who are working at the fundamental level with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, they're really making strides with, you know, all the com computational power that is available today. And uh, so uh, by no means, uh, you know, is it something that uh, is being undermined is very important as Jim was saying. Uh, however, uh, you know, people, there has been talk that, hey, maybe AI, artificial intelligence is going to uh, become, you know, make machines that are smarter than human beings, uh, what they call the, the, the technology singularity. Uh, but that, that's going to, you know, I, I think it's predicted to uh, happen sometime, maybe 2050 or so. But, um, but let, we are looking at the here and now and maybe the next 10 years. How do we make be the best use of uh, AI? And uh, that's where we're coming from. Trying to utilize this technology to um, to really improve uh, our uh, you know our process manufacturing operations. Uh, this is an interesting example, Jim. Sure, I mean so so it just just early on in in, in engineering history, we 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 started trying to trying to analyze and and apply the tools, uh, and in this case, we're applying it to a. Um, uh, it's a small manufacturer. It's, fin it's a finishing unit using uh, C8 to C22 hydrocarbons. Basically, separating these mixtures. It's a very simple process. Sim taking those those molecules and dividing them up into into specific products that typically with the C8 to C10s, C C C10s to C12s, or C C12 to C14s. Just kind of all the way from from C8 to C22s. Basically, you know these hydrocarbon chains separate them out into, into streams that, that are applicable to, to the, the particular customers. And we started this with the idea of applying the data analytics and how we're gonna improve the energy and efficiency of this process. And so we, we went down that path and, and we certainly did. We, we, we said, okay, we have, here's, here's the, the handles that you have to address that. And using simulation, machine learning, we were able to identify that. But one of the things that was really critical in, in terms of achieving this success was we started looking at, let's look at what does it take to, to maximize production. And if you think about, you've got the, the throughput, you've got the yield, and you've got the availability of the equipment. And how do we maximize each of those components? And so we really were focusing on that. And so production, which is really the, the, the sum of, of, of the throughput, the yield, and the, and the availability of the equipment, um, applying the, the data, applying the simulations, being able to put that in place. And in this case, a fairly simple way of looking at, it's coming down to the planning and scheduling. Because if you can maximize that, that those, those, those distillation units, you can keep things up and running. But what was so surprising is using machine learning data analytics, improving the production by over 30%. And you think you know, that just doesn't seem possible you know, in, in, in today's world to be able to improve, we're not, we're not changing the, the, the operation. We're not, we didn't change the equipment, the distillation columns. And this was a plant that had been operating for, for years. And you kind of see in, in the diagram on, on the far left on production that, uh, I mean, just due to, and you can kind of see the reason why that the, 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 the way that they're planning and scheduling their, their, their runs and their operation, their capabilities and their capacity drop significantly. And so when we came in to apply the, the um, machine, the, the basically the, 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 the logical analysis, the data analytics behind this, you, you can see that very first year we maximized their maximum production ever. And in that year, there was a hurricane that kind of wiped out the, the uh, shut down the plant for almost a month. So you think, okay, 11 months versus 12 months, and we achieved their best ever. And then the following year, another, you know, another 10% on top of that. And then the following year, another 10%. Gradual changes, but just applying that knowledge, increasing the the the, the uh, capabilities of first pass quality. Really, when we're getting up to that, we see that first pass quality of ninety six point three. 
you really asymptotic to, to perfect there. And the key there was being able to, to look at the, the runs they're making, being able to get that information ahead of time as to what the customers were needing. And then looking at what the inventory was in the plant, being able to run the plants as, as productively as possible, know what inventory was needed to meet the customer demand in the future. So being able to look not just at, at what we're doing right now, but being able to look at what's in the future, what's going to happen, and being able to be, be predictive about that, and being able to say, you know, we don't have all the sales right now, but we, we this is what has typically happened in the past, and then producing to that level, taking those as a, we had typically when you're running a columns these columns that are that are doing multiple products, you're going to have transition tanks, you're going to have equipment, the material that needs to be rerun, which really that is the same as have not having the, 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 the columns available. And so being able to push that production, meet the demands of the customers and, and being able to, to I mean, this 30% increase in, pr in productivity by just being able to have those, that predictive capability. So, um, and, you know, look at, looking at what handles you have, the, the, the throughput, the, the availability of the equipment, um, and then, of course, the yield. So, yeah, and uh, I, I think Jim, you'll remember uh, when we first started this. Uh, uh, you know, the the general thought there uh, was that uh, we we're doing the best, and there's nothing better that can be done. But very quickly, I think essentially this is a classic example of uh, you know how the analytics and the uh, the augmented intelligence that uh, was provided to uh, the operations. Uh, they were the ones who were able to actually do this. And so, you know, that's, um, yeah, that, that's really what the wonders of uh, being able to do the analytics, looking at various aspects. Uh, of, in this case, it was manufacturing and, uh, you know, the downstream distribution and logistics uh, together, uh, managing the inventory that uh, was able to make this happen. And it was, again, Example of the augmented intelligence. Yeah, I think I think it's funny that we you know we we looked at that and, and, and providing that insight and helping them capture that value, um, done very subtly and 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 so I think initially there was, a, there was a question of so you know we haven't made any huge changes in our equipment is is this is this really helping us. And you had to, you know, it's, it's happening so subtly and you, know, you had to make, you know, having those dashboards to be able to say, well, you know, you've actually produced a lot more. You're not producing it more rapidly, but you're avoiding all the mistakes that you, you previously had. And they're going, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. And then, and then that second year when, when it went up another 10%, then, they're, then they got really fired up and said, wow, to think, okay, we're at 20% more capacity with the same equipment. And, uh, and then when it went up, you know, finally... Uh, to the, the over 30% and truly running at, you know, mathematically optimal. So it, it was uh, it, just an incredible success with that. Now, focusing on, on, um, on, on this area, um, certainly want, want to uh, take a look here and, and uh, you know, talk a little bit about uh, the, the process. And so, if you go with digit, uh, digitization, I mean, that, that is making the data available. So if you think of your digital transformation process, it really starts with digitization in terms of making that information available for everybody. And then the next step is digitalization. And there you're looking at how do I analyze that data? What are the tools that I use to analyze that data? How is that data presented? And being able to, to, to make that in a highly visual format for the for the engineers and operators, and then we get to digital transformation. That's really the process where you're actively using that information. It's not just applying the tools; it is figuring out how to apply the tools to the issue at hand. In that last example, the issue that really came down to it, improving the efficiency, uh, what was important but the percentage change in profitability and production of the company was minor. The key was being able to interpret and predict the, the, the right needs for the, for, the, for, the, for the plant, being able to, to look at the impacts, being able to schedule the runs accordingly, 
to be able to produce to a, you know, you, you've got the inventory constraints on one side where you have limited, limited uh, tanks. I mean, you, you, it's not that they had very few product tanks. So you had to have the right product going into those product tanks. And then you had the, the, the customer demand and you had the, the upstream um, basically material. You, being able to balance all those and produce that, that is really an example of using digital transformation where, where you're, 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 you, you've done the analytics, but how do you apply it? And what's the best way to apply it to your uh, manufacturing operations in order to get the most out of it? So what we focus on here is saying, how do you make that shift? How do you make that shift to making that data that was so important as part of the digitization process, bringing it, uh, making it available for everybody, being able to analyze it well, and then how do you make it where you're answering questions that are preventing you from being at the, the highest production level possible. So, and it, again, what Ingenero calls this is augmented intelligence and being able to take that, take that artificial intelligence or the data analytics and make it into intelligence in the hands of the operators and engineers. So. Uh, right, so the, it's, it's really we're talking of a shift in focus from just looking at tools and what it is to really, how, how can you um, utilize those to, to make it useful? And the key is um, augmenting the intelligence uh, of the, uh, the teams that are really running, running the, uh, the facility. Here, here's, a, here's another example that I uh, wanted to briefly talk about because in terms of being able to make that shift from doing the analytics to being able to motivate people to do the right uh, things, to, to give them the, 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 the insights to make the right changes. This is an example of a, more of a midstream example where you have a cryogenic gas plant. So here, uh, it may be difficult to, to, to see, but we're, there, what, what this does is for the, for the operators of, that, of those gas processing plants, is they're able to see what is going on right now. Okay, but that, that's, that's simple, that's a DCS system. But then it's also giving the numbers for if this was running at theoretical optimal, where would that plant be? And here we're using mainly simulation. So to, it's a fairly simple process to be able to specify for that particular plant, how much more money they can make that particular day and what changes are needed? Because I mean, you could have a dashboard that says, okay, you're not performing up to par, but that's not the, that's not the, 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 key, the key. The key is being able to provide that insight and awareness, and then that motivation for them to be able to, to close that gap and those insights on how to do it. So what you see in this picture is, this is what was very, very effective in terms of uh, uh, for, for the, this particular plant because it, it gave the, 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 the operators not only the, you know, wh where, where they stood, but also how to get to the best, the best uh, point possible. So for, they had, for this, this is a, a, a you know, gas processing plant, it's fairly simple. You've got about 35 gas processing plants for this particular manufacturer. What we did for them, being able to put this, these, these models in place, um, they achieved an additional 25 million, just an operating profit per year. And that's just rolling to the bottom line every year. And you look at the daily margin, the difference in daily margins, that typically was running anywhere from 2000 to a high of almost $40,000 a day. Again, you say, well, that's not exciting numbers for small gas processing plants. But when you've got that many gas processing plants, 35 gas processing plants, and by putting in this simple process to be able to, to put an additional screen in, in, their, in their facility to say, you know, here's the best that you could be doing. And here's the settings you'd need to get, if you could get the equipment to these settings, you would be able to get to that particular margin. So that $2,000 to $40,000 difference went down to just several hundred dollars difference for, you know, per day where they're, where they're actively going at it. You're, you're really at the, the level of, of accuracy of the instrumentation within those facilities and, and, and being able to achieve that, that much uh, in, in the way of savings, you know, is, Absolutely incredible. Again, just speaking to the power of being able to present the information that's needed to the operators and engineers to allow them to make that adjustments. You know, and I hope we're not coming across as saying Ingeniero did this and 
engineer will help take the information, analyze the information, and be able to present it to the to the engineers and operators, help them craft what they needed in order to to make these make this transition. And again, they were able to do you know uh, increase the profitability of the firm dramatically. I mean, you, you, twenty five million per year rolling to the bottom line, just on uh, you know fairly simple implementation of, of this of this simulation. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, like Jim was saying, behind the scenes, uh, you know, there's uh, there's a fair amount of analytics that uh, happens, uh, data driven as well as some fundamental knowledge in, incorporated. Uh, but these are screens that are now uh, available in real time uh, at each facility as well as uh, you know in a central uh, location, uh, so you can you know the the client is able to pull it up and at any point uh, see you know how they're running, what the gaps are, and how they can close those gaps. So uh, so and uh, you know and that's really uh, again providing augmented intelligence uh, to the people uh, whether running the business or running. The production facility itself. Uh, interesting example there. You know, and Pratap, I think it's 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 that the, the point that you're making. You know, I think is, is really important. That we had the big well, at the corporate headquarters, they had what was called the big screen room, and uh, so it falls right in line with with this augmented intelligence and how do you make your people more productive? They had the the in the big screen room. At, at corporate headquarters, yeah, I mentioned there was a screen in the in the operating uh, centers at, at each particular, basically the at each uh, processing plant. Um, you know, the, the, right above the the the, the DCS screens, you, you had a screen that was called, you know, it was actually called the big screen as well. But it just talked about where where the plant, you know, it was, it was that 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 screen, and you could dive into more details uh, beneath but each each of those screens to get into specifics. But at the corporate headquarters, they had these massive, they had one room, they had these massive television screens that were able to, they could pull up any of those plans. And they had lead operators in, the, in, in at those particular facilities to be able to look at those screens and be able to help each one of those plans in terms of providing advice or whether it was, even if it was some, as simple as there is, a, we're having a mechanical issue and they needed uh, people to, to, to go ahead and facilitate getting, Parts there faster. Being able to talk through that with with industry or experts. I mean, that some of the engineers that were world class at, at at operating these particular gas processing plants knew the technology backwards and forwards. Were available, could look at what was going on at the corporate headquarters. This could go down from you know they had it and then the big screen. This could even go down to the handheld devices if need be. But it was just a, a, a tremendous process. Kind of shows where the industry is going. Being able to have that capability to have that level of information at the at at uh, in the hands of and in, in the view of, of the experts uh, for the company so um, you know I think uh, the, the point I wanted, wanted to make here is is that using the tools and the data uh, you've got to have a process to convert that from you know from just being a tool being able to analyze that data and provide that augmented intelligence to get to that value. And so, um, you know, I think that's, that, that's a key. And, and so for, for us, we're, we're we'll calling it high speed, but, but I mean, I think, you know, even if you're not using engineering to try to do it, but do it yourselves, being able to just say, how do I use those tools? That's, it's a very critical to be able to say, here's the tools, here's the value, and how do I get there and applying them in a, in a manner that generates, uh, uh, what the manufacturing teams need to be able to, to, to deliver that value. Right. So the, the tools by themselves, like we were saying earlier, you know, they don't really do the trick. So the tools are like atoms. And what you really need is a molecule, uh, which is a solution that can combine various of these tools uh, and provide the augmented intelligence that, that is required. Now, going from these tools uh, to uh, the the solution, uh, like going from the atom to the molecule, uh, there is a certain level of engineering and expertise that is required, which requires multidimensional teams, a whole process, uh, utilizing a lot of the data, uh, the big data that is there, and uh, so that that is a key piece. And oftentimes, people get lost, uh, you know, just thinking, hey, the tools will do the trick for me. 
uh, but that this is where you know where successful digitalization programs uh, and we've been part of uh, a few of those now and uh, this is what we've learned along with the companies uh, are key pieces which are often uh, times uh, in the white spaces of uh, proposals that are uh, are put forth uh, but at the end of the day the value uh, that you get out of it is really the key and the augmented intelligence is really what delivers that to the manufacturing teams being able to uh, drive that value yeah, and you know I, th I think that that comment you're, you're making about atoms going to molecules is is so apropos i mean you think you, you've got all the tools that are out there and the key is to be able to combine those tools and and you and and the value that that's that's the molecule and so so how do you that process. I mean, that's essentially what we're in, right? We're in the, the chemical process industry downstream, being able to, to take that from you're, you're taking the atoms and making them in, into the right, right molecules. Um, and, uh, you know, granted, sometimes it's just separation, but still the principle applies where you're saying, okay, how do I get to those molecules? And that's where the value is. And as Pratap was saying that the, the, the white space there, that is critical. How do you do that? But but I think then this is this is meant more as a summary. So and I think the, the a key aspect is is talking about um, how do we get the boat the most out of both the technology and the people, and how do we how do we take those tools and combine that with the the existing human intelligence to be able to generate that value and and, and identifying what that value is from the very start the higher productivity, higher earnings, um, being able to get, you know, for the, 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 for the people, of course, it is also making them a more integral part um, of the decision-making process where they're, they're, they're no longer there just to watch a process um, and try to keep it from going off, off track, but to actively look at uh, understanding the, the, the availability of the equipment, the reliability of the instrumentation, are there any changes in what's going on, and being able to really push the production and so and, and, and do so in a safe manner. So you're you're actively going from an employee who's sitting back to to just you know keep it between the navigational buoys there to being able to really push that to the push that to the next level. Right. So uh is artificial intelligence very very powerful tool? Um, it's you know nowhere near being able to replace uh, the human uh, being in the intelligence and having a lights out factory at least not in the next uh, decade or so. So today, really, the best use of it is to uh, handle some of the road tasks that are currently being handled by humans, uh, and uh, of course some of the time-consuming tasks and large multi-dimensional analysis. Uh, which may take a lot of time for a human being to really take care of. Uh, so essentially, uh, you slim uh, from areas uh, that uh, and and shift the human intelligence into areas that may be uh, you know higher level of uh, work. Uh, so that's really what this whole augmented intelligence is all about, utilizing the technology of artificial intelligence. Here's another example. It's certainly, I mean, and, and, and we'll speed up here a little bit, but, but this is another example of how do you take that artificial intelligence and move it towards augmented intelligence? How do you improve? Um, so this is for a furnace. So you look at, this is one of the tools we built for a company that was, it's, it's absolutely uh, critical for them. It really controls their production is, is, is the furnaces. And how do, you, how do you look at getting the, the, the higher run length availability of equipment? How do you push the yield um, versus the throughput? Uh, versus the availability of that equipment, because those are those are there, there's a mathematical optimal, but how do you reach that mathematical optimal in terms of because if you increase the yield or increase the throughput, you're going to increase the coking, you're going to take the plant down more often, and then how do you minimize that downtime? Those are all things that can be handled and can and should be should be analyzed and should be known. Uh, with with and using artificial intelligence, you can really understand what are the handles that you have, and uh, so yeah, that, that's just an example screen of that. And so a lot of lot of these uh, you know, j just by uh, the raw data may not give you some of these uh, these kind of uh, 
you know, uh, KPIs, if you will. Uh, so these require some level of uh, analysis and prediction. And uh, providing that uh, is really what uh, then, you know, gives the insights and the ability to come up with uh, certain prescriptions. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that, that's, that's really key. I mean, you look at being able to have that, that predictability to those, to those, be able to understand if I make a change with this handle, you know, what am I going to do to overall production and that kind of insight, this is a, this is a, a, a for one particular uh, company in, in the Middle East where you're looking at the different facilities that they have, uh, they have out there and being able to apply this analytics to, to their furnaces. Um, they were able to, increase their furnace run length, which really is a big part of how much that they could, they could keep those, those furnaces going and, uh, and run them. And if you look at the handles where yield and furnace run length are uh, counterposed to each other, they were able to both increase the yield, which, you know, direct impact on profitability, but also dramatically increase the furnace run length. So you're, you're increasing the yield, you're increasing the throughput, and you're increasing the, the, the run length, being able to understand what is capable there was was the key, and again, it's you know, top was mentioning, it's being able to predict and 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 prescribe a, advice there. Just a, a a little bit there in terms of making that uh, making that jump. I think this is a, again kind of more of a summary, saying the digital twin technology where we utilize simulation and data analytics, being able to apply those analytics, and it's really that combination of having both the digital twin. Uh, along with the the analytics point, and that's what leads to aut aut augmented intelligence, which leads to excellence. And uh, Ingenero's tagline has always been excellence through insight. Back in and so when we started in 2002, being able to say data analytics and simulation are keys to to being able to run um, a refinery, petrochemical plant more effectively. <clears throat> and what do we need to do to try to make companies be able to utilize these tools, these great process engineering tools to be able to, to run, their, run their companies better. And that was the idea. And, uh, and looking at some of the things that we, we, we came up with, and one thing, you know, with having both the, the real-time analytics and the simulation, a key aspect was it's not, either one of those is not enough. You really, if you're going to have the real-time analytics, you need to make sure that the digital twin, which is it, it more or less a, um, you know, is it, well, it's more than just a digital representation of the plant. It is being able to, to uh, apply fundamental chemical engineering principles to, uh, to, de to describe what is going on with the plant and how to answer questions that are, that are, that are needed. But those in combination, you need to make sure on the, da the data analytics where it's coming with that statistical analysis, you need to make sure that the information that is being that's being presented is explained by the science, you know, the, the, the fundamental principles that are in your simulation and your digital twin, and make sure that those go hand in hand. And when that when that happens, being able to take that and roll that into the augmented intelligence. Yeah, so really, it's a hybrid uh, that is uh, that's very useful. So one way of looking at it is there's a lot of knowledge that has been built. Uh, in this whole area of uh, chemical engineering and uh, you know, running facilities uh, over several years. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the data-driven models uh, can you know, be more uh, self-learning and so on uh, once it's trained and brought to a certain level. Uh, so that's really what uh, this combination does. Uh, you kind of give the data-driven models a jump start, uh, so they start at a very different level with a lot of innate intelligence and then they, they kind of adapt, uh, self-learn and uh, sustain. So that, that's the whole idea and uh, you know, that's really what enables this whole augmented intelligence in closer to real time and hence the, you know, the insights. Because these are you know, examples of different uh, levels of and types of an, uh, analytics, uh, like we're saying, there's basic descriptive level analytics, which basically tells you what is currently happening. Uh, more of the diagnostic and analytics, uh, which says why something is occurring. Uh, a lot of it is what ifs and, and scenario studies. Predictive, 
think what is likely to happen looking forward and then prescriptive, which actually says, this is what uh, you can do to improve or avert the situation. So as you can see, uh, you know, there, there'll be an increasing level of complexity in the, these levels of analytics, but obviously the value you can get out of it also increases as your complexity of the analytics improves. And uh, so uh, it's really a combination of all this that ends up providing the uh, augmented intelligence uh, solutions. Jim, you have I think, think you know, that, that point you're making, I mean, it, complexity and value, they go hand in hand. I mean, if you think about what, where, where people are successful and, and why they fail, because you think digital transformation, they say most digital transformation projects fail. And it's that lack of understanding of the complexity that, that to, to get there. Being able to, you know, here, here when, we say, when we say descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, prescriptive, it's the, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the what, the how, uh, how much, and how, how to fix kind of just answering the, the, the standard questions of why, how, where, when, what, being able to answer those questions, that, that's what it's, it's getting to. The data is there, but the complexity of getting there <laughs> is high. Yeah, here, here the, the whole idea is, uh, yeah, how, how do you automate uh, this whole uh, augmented intelligence? Here, here's a solution. Uh, that uh, we, we've been um, actually uh, deploying and now given our years of experience with uh, some of our clients. Uh, the whole idea is, like I was saying earlier, uh, yes, data, there's lots of data available. Uh, now with the, the internet of things, it can be made anywhere. So you don't need experts to uh, go to the data. The data can go to the experts wherever they are. Uh, but the whole idea, whether you can have pretty looking dashboards, uh, but if you just take raw data and throw it at those dashboards, uh, we have seen a lot of cases where uh, you are misled and the decisions taken could, could just go awry. And uh, so the analytics and being able to take the data, convert it into, uh, you know, remove the errors, because errors are inherent in a lot of these data. Uh, so doing a lot of the analytics and then providing uh, data in the form of a prescription or uh, you know prediction uh, rather than just the raw data. And that's what the whole crux of augmented intelligence is. And that's what makes the difference. Let's, let's I mean, it, 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 it's critical, it's complex. And in fact, this, this slide really dis describes the complexity that's, that's involved in, in, for example, moving from making that data useful. So we really get into, in this slide, decision excellence engineering and, and that process of going through to say, what is it about, how do we get to that value proposition? How do we, because that really is the key, right? You've got, you've got the data, um, you've got the tools, being able to say, how do I get to that value proposition? And what does it take? And, and it really comes down to, to building that system, cleaning that data, analyzing the data in the right way, making that a, a, an ongoing process where you're act actively looking at the value and trying to get to that value. Um, so, I mean, you know, we, we, we go, th go through this in more detail if you like. Bob, um, if there's anything in particular that you, you think we should, we should, uh, should talk yeah. about right there, but otherwise- Yeah, we'll I mean, you, you covered that, uh, Jim. I mean, there's a lot of complex pieces. Uh, it's a combination of, uh, you know, a lot of your domain expertise, software engineering, uh, data science, and uh, certainly, I guess, I guess we were able to uh, do some of these things because of the, you know, the long experience we've had with analytics in this specific uh, area. So maybe, maybe we can get started with some very quick uh, case studies. Of course, we've shared some with you, but here very specifically, um, this is one application uh, with a, a delayed coca unit uh, and with one of the refiners uh, we're working with. Uh, of course, again, like I was saying, uh, the artificial intelligence and ML type models were trained with a lot of the fundamental models. Uh, and today it's, in, it's running in real time. The type of augmented intelligence that uh, right at the operator level or the operating engineers get is look at these red tubes. It tells you exactly which tubes are fouling. Uh, this is a furnace, uh, the furnace of the delayed coker. And uh, so, uh, you know, we're able to predict the whole system 
provides the augmented intelligence in the form of predicted uh, TMTs versus actual uh, predicted, uh, you know, end of run. It uh, predicts out and says what the end of run TMTs would be, and then give, provides prescriptions. Uh, so here, if you look at it, uh, you you have descriptive type of information, and then it predicts out and says. Um, you know, given where you are today, uh, what it's going to look like uh, and where is it going to end the furnace run length? Uh, it says another nine days. And then it also prescribes and says what you could do uh, to, uh, if you uh, make the, take these actions, you can uh, push the run length out. Of course, if this starts from day uh, one, uh, well, you get much a much higher run length. Uh, so what the engineers have achieved is live guidance on furnace burner management uh, through the augmented intelligence, effective removal of, of, removal of coke in a short time, higher, higher furnace availability. So these are the kinds of things that uh, really come out from an augmented intelligence system. Uh, Jim, should I run through the next couple of slides? Yeah, go ahead and run through. I mean, this it's a great example. But here's another. We're going to stick with the same examples of the same. Uh, are this particular refinery is having issues with its cokers, and um, and it's great examples of, of of using that predictive and prescriptive approach, and uh, of using machine learning to to really look at what is capable uh, in this facility, and give the operators not just here's where you stand, but here's what's needed. I think this is a great example of the outage. So go, go ahead and step, why don't you step through this? Yeah, here, here, here's, uh, yeah, the outage this is an interesting one because uh, typically uh, you know, it's very difficult to accurately measure what this outage, uh, you know, about the, the coal, uh, the coke bed uh, is. And of course, there's a foam as well. Uh, you don't want to operate this too high because if the foam goes over the pipes, you really end up shutting down the plant. Uh, but at the same time, how do you minimize this uh, and uh, you know, avoid uh, possible uh, foam over? Uh, so in other words, uh, you know, get uh, the, uh, the best uh, run lengths before you uh, start switching the coke drums. Uh, and so again, a lot of augmented intelligence possible here, uh, which is impossible to even look at or, or understand or see with just the, the raw data or even simple calculations. Uh, so that was a very quick example. And this has been very, very useful for the operations uh, running these, uh, these coke drums. You know, I think that one of the, the points there, it really was a paradigm buster in terms of when you looked at those for the, for the operators and the engineers, they really thought, okay, industry standard is, is gonna be somewhere we're running at an outage closer to 17 or 18. And they assured me that that's where they were. But when the, you looked at three years worth of data, you know, your average was more like 22 to 20, 25. So you've got a lot of, a lot of room. And in fact, you're, 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 you're cutting short your runs by almost 25%. So it, it's, well, actually this is just the outage part. So a little less than that, but still you're, you're affecting, you're affecting the, uh, the, the, your, your capabilities and, 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 significantly you're leaving significant uh, runtime on the table and it really comes down to not just telling the operators where they stand in terms of that outage but giving them the comfort level to say i can keep pushing i can keep pushing and i'm not going to have a foam over because i know where my foam layer is at i know where my 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 levels are at and within the this i know my outage at, at all times and being able to have that within the coke drums uh and you're just using basically machine learning and, and, and simulation to, to to be able to get there was was impressive and, and you very very useful yeah, here's another example of, uh, you know, again, it's predictive sensors uh, using machine learning and so on, where uh, even if this, in this case, uh, yeah, the sensors, even if the actual physical sensor uh, drops out, uh, you know, the, the machine learning, the soft sensor was able, was able to continually predict where you would end up. And uh, this really helped, uh, you know, prevent uh, maintenance shutdown well, yeah, if you want to wrap this up because I mean, this was a good, a good, you know, and just a summary slide where, where we're talking about how do you how do you get predictive and prescriptive, and how do you provide the right information to the op operators and engineers. Um, 
uh, you, you, utilizing both fundamental models and simulation and the data analytics. But uh, go ahead, Pratap, you know, wrap that up in terms of. Right, so th this was, again, I mean, the, the whole idea of uh, being able to provide the augmented intelligence, the results kind of speak for themselves. Uh, which is, these are real results that uh, we saw with, uh, in another facility. Um, so that, that, I think, kind of uh, wraps it up. And, uh, Raj, I think we should hand it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Patap. Thank you, Jim. So first of all, thank you very much for taking us through a journey of uh, uh, f uh, Industrial Revolution 1 to 4 and uh, how in the Industrial Revolution 4 we can make a, a real uh, uh, benefit out of the technology. I liked a few things. Uh, I liked your uh, coining the phrase of Internet of People instead of Internet of Things. Uh, you know, uh, people uh, seem to get too hooked up on AI, uh, thinking that AI is going to give every decision. No, not not so. Uh, I had a, a great uh, doubt on this uh, always. A machine uh, is programmed and it is running on algorithm and algorithms are uh, written by human and humans have biases. How are you going to remove those? They, it's very difficult. So you need to still have a human intelligence who will take the help of AI provided data and then do the rest and uh, take the informed decisions. So all AI is doing is giving you help, taking away the burden of what you need to do, you needed to do at a great cost of time and uh, you know, uh, uh, data. Now you need to offload that to AI and then focus on insight. And I like that atom to molecule analogy. Uh, you can't do much with atom. You need a molecule to make a, a good use in your life. So uh, from the data, you take the molecule of knowledge insight. So your uh, molecule is the insight. And uh, once that insight is available to an operator, uh, it's not a rocket science anymore. He can simply use that insight to take the necessary action press the right button, set the necessary, uh, you know, dials. And uh, also I liked your descriptive, diagnostic, predictive and prescriptive, uh, you know, gradual uh, increase in the uh, uh, help uh, to the operators. Now, uh, I just have a couple of questions before I open the floor to our subject matter experts and we have a few people lined up to ask question. Um, is this a framework? what you have described, is it a framework which is established in, a, in an organization based on your uh, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, tools or is it an off the shelf something which you can buy and hook in? It's not something that I'd say is off the shelf, uh, but having done this for so many years, we've, yes, we've created a framework and so we're not starting from zero. You, you start with uh, at a certain level uh, and then you configure it and uh, customize it okay. uh, to specific needs. Okay. Uh, because everyone has different needs, even if you look at individual equipment or uh, unit operations or even people and businesses. And so that's really uh, taking this and then you know, delivering and that. Uh, you know, I, I was going to go with saying it's both, right? Because I mean, you've got, as Pratap's saying, and as you're saying, Raj, I mean, you can start at different at different levels, and 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 I know for 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 you know several customers, they, they've got a historian and they've got their DCS system, and how do you? Uh, but you you can you can wrap analytics around that to provide more insight to them. But they had their existing historian, and we're just wrapping some analytics, some a little bit of programming around that to deliver. So in that case, you're you're taking an off-the-shelf product but you're wrapping some analytics around it to get that insight to come to the operator. So in that case, you know, it's, it's almost off the shelf, but it's the customization of that off the shelf to the client that really has to happen. And, you know, right. certainly engineer has its own platforms that it says, okay, here's to make it simple as opposed to trying to use just what's there. Let's, let's pull it into a, a bigger analytical engine to make it faster, yeah. uh, more comprehensive, being able to handle, uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of data points versus 
um, just, you know, 3,000, 4,000 that the historian's handling rapidly and well to be able to take those, you know, we can still take three or 4,000, pull them in, do the analytics and stick them back out. But again, it, it's customized in that case of off your existing platforms. Right. And is there, is this framework something which is a common, can be uh, applied in different plants and different facilities or everywhere it has to be built from base? There is a common thread uh, when you look at process manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the, the blocks are there, if you will. Uh, but then it's, it's really like taking it from the 70 to 100 percent where, right. where there's a level of customization. So there is uh, something like 60, 70 percent, which is common. You take that and then you customize it to make it your 100 uh, percent compatibility. Right. That's that's good. At this point, I would that's like great. to open the floor for our subject matter experts. And I believe Mr. Masafumi from Idimitsu, you have a question. Can you please uh, uh, put on your video yes. and audio so we can see you? Yes, Mr. Masafumi, go ahead with your question. Hi. Yeah, yeah, this is Masafumi Miami. I'm based in uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, UAE. And so I'm a member of Idemitsu, uh, is a refined uh, Japanese oil companies. And thank you very much for your kind presentations. And uh, firstly, I introduce my companies. Uh, Idemitsu has uh, six refineries in Japan. And also we have uh, uh, real-time systems, uh, like uh, as you uh, explained. Uh, our system is uh, belong to the other companies. Also, we can see the refineries operation conditions, uh, even, even though I'm being in the office. So this is very good systems, and so it is very useful. But so I have, I think uh, we can we can easily uh, check the operating conditions. But so it is a little bit difficult to adjust the operation conditions because because uh, as you explained, uh, the demand is uh, every time change, and so the oil price also every time change. So the, my first question is, how do we adjust the operating conditions? Uh, in real times, it's my first question. And so, se second question is uh, for your strategies uh, after twenty or thirty years future, uh, who will operate the refineries? It's my second second question. <laughs> and sure. third question, third question. Sorry, third question is uh, in the future, how do you think for the safety policy in the refineries? Uh, if we if we uh, uh, use uh, AI for the operations, uh, it is a little bit difficult to, to, to decide the safety policies. So that's why I ask it to you. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, good, very good questions, uh, Miyami-san. Um, and um, with regard to, you know, how do you do it in real time? Now, uh, there, what, um, when we say real time, it really depends on the application. Every, depending on what you're trying to do, um, yeah. you know, which uh, which equipment, which unit operation, which uh, you know KPI. Uh, yes, your real time could be uh, streaming data, or it could be intervals of five minutes or one minute, uh, because it may not make sense to run everything in streaming. Uh, so that kind of uh, you know, how, how you do that, uh, how often you need to do that to be able to capture the value uh, is, is also uh, yeah. a key decision which you need to understand, which is where some domain experience comes in. Uh, because you don't want to force real, you know, uh, streaming data on everything. So uh, yeah. that's kind of, you know, really depending on, you know, what the application is, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to get out of it. So in that outage example, uh, that is something where you need close, almost close to streaming data, uh, mm. you know, analytics. Uh, whereas uh, maybe in the furnace run link, you you can have a little more, uh, you know, semi batch type of uh, uh, analysis happening. Uh, so th that's really your, you know, uh, what I would say for the first question. Uh, I'll just go through all the three, and then maybe Jim can add to that. 
Sure. Uh, the second the thing you were talking about uh, was what, what happens in the future. Yeah, who will operate? Uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I guess it's a little crystal ball. And that's what we were saying that today, where the, the technology is of artificial intelligence, um, you know, we're, we're talking another uh, maybe 20 years or so, the way we're looking at it, uh, before you can really start automating a lot of things. Because even your artificial intelligence systems have to learn. Human beings have learned it over so many years, right? So you need to yes, bring yes. The, these artificial intelligence systems to, uh, to that level. Uh, and so that's, it's going to take time because you don't want, in your third question, you were saying safety uh, issues. You have to even, even yes. those kind of things, you have to teach the, you know, the AI system uh, so mm -hmm. that it's able to respond just like the human today, how, what you uh, do, you know, uh, almost instinctively is because of all the knowledge that you've got in that area. Uh, yeah. So uh, it, it, that's what we were saying. It, it, it's going to take a few years. You don't start, you know, think that you just put an artificial intelligence system and, uh, you know, within one month or two months or even a year, it's going to start operating automatically. Hence, oh, yeah. in these years, you can use the technology, but the best use of that technology is to give augmented intelligence to mm. the, the experts and the operations people who are already there. And they go to a very different level. They can you know, do much better with that augmented intelligence using AI. So that's kind of you know, our, our thought process uh, you know, in that area, uh, Miyamisan. san uh, Okay, yeah. Uh, Thank you, you very much for your answer. And, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, I think for very good points and, and thank you for those questions. And, and I, I do believe that, uh, that one of the strengths of that, the, that the, the AI machine learning is bringing is that predictive and prescriptive um, advice. And so one of the things, I mean, you, you, as you mentioned, I mean, prices are going to change and there's some global, global impacts that, that are not at the local level. And, um, we, we have been trying, or I shouldn't say we, but you know, certainly the industry has been trying to be able to predict those swings and, and things like that and how it affects performance. For the, for the plant, it's really down to, um, it comes down to how do we optimize for the inventory that we have of, of crude material to the products that, we're, that, that, are, that are, are that are in our demand. We're, we're optimizing at that level currently. You know, hopefully in the future, we, we can start stabilizing some of these swings in prices and you know, you know, global economic uh, um, impacts. But if Pratap and I really were the experts there, mm, we probably would not be sitting here talking about selling. To it. Uh, how do you solve it? it, it problems like that. We, we'd be would be wealthy by investing in the stock market and and being able to predict those trends and as opposed to moaning and groaning and hitting the sales path. <laughs> Anyways, but uh, you know, and, and to your point also about the. Uh, you know about you know where where things are going in the industry. Certainly, more and more automation is, is coming into play, and and uh, you know there's there's certainly the fears of um, you know a robotic society and things like that. But at the end of the day, we're, it, it is about um, and and we we are a world of people, and we're here to um, you know to to have, have have a good life. And and I think that the the key is for us and and, and the that we're going to bend the technology to meet the needs of people and meet the needs of, 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 of production of goods for those people. And so that aspect of being able to constantly augment intelligence, yes, you may, you may find people being much, much more productive, but at the end of the day, that, that, that aspect of, of, of the human interaction is going to be there for quite some time as, as uh, just as we, as a society, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's not really about, um, you know, saying, okay, in every case, it, it, is, it is about producing more and, 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 uh, and, and being more effective. That is, that is the case, but then globally, we're, we're producing it for people. And, and, and that aspect of having a fulfilled life and things like that, that's going to be inherently part of, uh, of society going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Pratap. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Masafumi. Uh, Abu Tarek, do you have any question you would like to make any comment? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pritab and Jim, for a well 
uh, an excellent presentation. I'm glad you said that human beings are not going to be replaced because I think human is still needed. However, of course, with uh, this uh, technology and artificial intelligence, we will have reduction or minimization of uh, people. Uh, now, my question is, do we need or what pre-requirement is needed uh, from an, a refinery, say, or a plant in order to benefit uh, mostly from AL, uh, you know, AI, you know, intelligent, uh, you know, artificial intelligence uh, and Internet of Things. What, one of the basic things that uh, would be required uh, is uh, the data, because everything, you know, the data is the, the, the basic input. Uh, so having that uh, available and accessible, uh, that becomes the input to any such uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, or or any even if it's a fundamental model. Uh, that's the the sense of reality. Uh, so that that is really the the only absolute requirement that uh, I would say that is there. Um, beyond uh, you know. You can take it from there and then build uh, various types of uh, you know, systems based on the end objective. Uh, so our our whole work with our clients has always been: think of what is there a problem that you're really trying to solve that is really hurting you, or is there something that you're looking to improve? Yes, if that's what it is, let's work backwards. Let's see what do we need to put in place uh, to really get the capture that value or address that problem. And when that happens, even things like what kind of data you need, what kind of automation you need to uh, with that data, those are kinds of things that fall in place and then get implemented in providing uh, solutions like this. Uh, so that, that's my Jim, you have something to add to that? Well, you know, I think, I think you're, I think you're exactly right. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the data is certainly key because you, you've got, but, but if you have a DCS system with a historian, you, you've got you a massive it. amount of data that you can analyze and, 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 and get the answer. But as Pratap was indicating, really to be successful, it, it, takes, it takes that commitment to use that information and to, to have a problem to address and, and to attack it, to, to, to say, I am going to utilize that data. I know it's going to be, it, it is a complex process to get from just data to have an insight, but I'm committed to doing it because it answers a very valuable question for me. And I think that, you know, you, you would think that people would go down this process of digitalization saying, I'm going to address this issue. I have this problem and it's costing me a lot of money. But if you look at why people fail in digitalization, it's not for lack of data. It's because they were enamored with the concept of digitalization, but not really saying, here's the path, and here's what I'm going to use that data for, and here's how I'm going to solve that issue that I'm having, and I'm committed to doing so. And so, you know, it, it is, once that is uh, achieved, then you really, really make, make that headway, and, and that's really the key. And so perhaps it's not even saying, what does the refinery need to have? It is, what is the attitude? And, 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 and the approach, the, the human aspects of a digitalization project are often, are often a big part of it. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we have Geoff from uh, IHS. Geoff, do you want to make any comment or you have a question? My, it's, uh, it's Jeff here. My apology. Um, I was just writing to state that I need to drop off, but I really appreciate uh, the session, I thought it was, it's excellent. It's a topical um, discussion uh, around AI and, um, and the value it brings with or without human intervention. So really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. So uh, is there any other question from any other subject matter expert? Uh, can I ask one question, Pratap? 
uh, if suppose someone wishes to start utilizing this augmented intelligence uh, what are the prerequisites are there something uh, of course data is the most important you said the basic input but apart from that do they have to have certain systems in place or they can start straight away as you said with a problem definition and then work around it and then start asking what tools I need what data I need and what uh, uh, analytics I need it always helps uh, to have uh, you know data in a digitized form uh, in other words the data you know if it's available in a historian which a lot of you know our type of facilities uh, do have uh, that I think uh, is you can build from there uh, right. with that and you know what what we're really trying to achieve uh, but that that is but having said that, I, I, I know, I mean, <laughs> Jim knows this very well. We, we have dealt with a facility where uh, we were pointed to a room with a whole stack of, uh, you know, what they call data on pieces of paper. Uh, so that, you know, that obviously you'll have to start digitizing it. And before you even start doing what I call the real work for, you know, digitalization. So that, yeah, that I would say is a prerequisite. Uh, because it makes things a lot, uh, you're Correct. getting and, you know, you're hitting the road running uh, if you have them. But there is no need to uh, uh, start making huge investment in uh, just uh, technology uh, without actually uh, identifying what definition, uh, what is your problem definition and what value you want to ultimately get. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, there's one, you know, the, the traditional way, I mean, some people have followed, particularly in much larger the thing is you take that leap of faith, stick all that technology in there and then and start hoping uh, you'll get value out of it. And, and you, well, you can get value out of it, but like Jim was saying, uh, that whole attitude, uh, okay, I've put all this in there. Now, how do I start really utilizing it to the, to the you know, hill and extract value? Uh, see where it's solving problems. Um, certainly, I mean, that's one way, but uh, we have found that a lot of people who have taken that path, uh, somewhere along the line, you know, that utilization hasn't really happened to that extent. And so then there's disappointment. Uh, whereas there are problems are known, uh, what needs to be solved, uh, or what you need to get at. Uh, so if you start from there, it makes things a lot easier and perhaps your your spend is a lot more effective because you, then you're not spending on things that maybe you're not going to get the, you know, the required result out of it. Uh, here you may be spending in a more optimal manner uh, versus the return that you'll get. You know, just, to add, just to add to that, I mean, if you, if you look at the, um, yeah, I think the, the approach and, and Raj, you, you basically indicated that I think you understand it well. I mean, it, it's, if you have, have, have a goal in mind and, and have an understanding of, of what that's going to save, and then be able to say, I'm going to apply those data analytics to that particular problem. And I'm going to get multiple re, multiples of the return of I'm gonna, that I'm investing in digitalization just by solving that problem. And so that is going to lead to success. Versus, I mean, as you said, as what Pratap was discussing, so many companies do, and that fear that 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 of saying, I need to adjust. The, the 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 industry is moving on. I need to have a digitalization strategy. I am going to go full bore. I am going to commit money and resources, and I'm going to buy all these tools. I'm going to implement those tools, and, and then lo and behold, there are no returns coming from that. I mean, it, it's it's just not enough to go and say I'm going to spend all this money. It's more important to say. What's it going to buy me? How am I going to get there intelligently? And then, no, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Um, I mean, again, as we were as alluded to before, in some cases, it is just taking the existing uh, historian and, and being able to add, you know, being able to add soft sensor capabilities, being able to add some predictive uh, capabilities so the operators know there are specific problems they need to address. And so you're addressing those specific problems. And there you're, you're, you're getting what seems to be a full, fully uh, digitalized solution for yeah. you know what, what ends up being tens of thousands of dollars, not even hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, and um, you know versus you know systems where people are saying I need to have all these tools, I need to buy this new platform, 
Mm -hmm. I need to, um, you know, update all my systems. And what you'll find is that most likely those companies won't even get there after, after that huge investment. Okay. So basically you want to make the technology work for you rather than you work for the technology. <laughs> I love that, Raj. I do. That's so yes. accurate. Okay. Well, uh, if we don't have any more question, uh, we would like to close this session today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pratap and Zim, uh, for sharing your insight uh, and uh, probably, you know, clearing some of the doubts. I mean, uh, many people probably don't understand the difference between digitization and digitalization. They think they are synonyms, uh, which is not the case. And uh, also how AI simply cannot serve you unless you have the control of AI. Uh, so all of these uh, thoughts are really insightful and I'm sure our viewers will benefit from it and they will apply the AI with the control in their hand rather than giving the control to AI. So with that note, thank you very much and viewers, uh, as you know that GDA Conversations is a series which has been going on for the last few months. We have had many excellent conversations with the industry leaders and subject matter experts in the past. All of them are available on our website. Please go to them. And if you wish to watch, you are most welcome. And if you have any question, which is probably not answered today in the conversation, you can write to us through our website info, and we will try to get the answer from Pratap and Jim back to you. So on that note, thank you very much. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you very much.